how do you direct a legend? Exactly, exactly. And you know, you can only, you can only direct a legend if you have their trust. And so I found that early on, luckily. <laughs> I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within. I was sinking to rise no more, but the master. In het mooi dromerige drama Mengelhorn zien we hoe een verbitterde oude man langzaam weer mensen toelaat in zijn leven. From the waters he lifted me. Now so safe am I. And it was love lifted me. We've been working with huge stars, the last two films. Joe had Nicolas Cage, this one is uh, El Pacino. Why the famous faces? Uh, well, you know, I think it's, these are great actors that I've always admired. I, I, I tend to live in my youth. Um, when I was 11 years old, I was really a film fanatic and really studied performances of, of so many actors at that time. And studied? Studied, yes. Just in, I mean, enjoy, was entertained oh. by, and, and would watch over and over. Um, and see, you know, Nicolas Cage watching him in Vampire's Kiss or Valley Girl or Raising Arizona or um, movies at that time or, or Pacino when I was discovering uh, particularly his body of uh, films in the 70s, Scarecrow, Panic in Needle Park, Godfather and uh, Serpico. These, these movies that really resonated with me in a very young uh, period of my, I don't know, interest in the industry. Uh, so to be able to have a, a project that makes sense and collaborates with them is like a childhood dream. Yeah, but you were 11 and you already knew you were going to be a film director. I, I know until, well, you know, when I was two, two weeks old, my parents took me to see Young Frankenstein and they said I didn't sleep and I didn't cry, I just watched the movie. So I, I've been a, 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 a big film fan for a very long time. But about 11 was when I started taking it seriously. Pacino, but how do you know you have something that will interest him? Well, we wrote it for him, and then I and I sent it to his agent. Um, and a couple days later, I got the call uh, from Al saying, "Hey, we come and meet me at my house and talk to me about it." So I flew out to L.A. and sat on his porch with him for a couple hours and told him what I wanted to do and why this was important to me and why he was the only guy for the job. And um, and, in, and then. For about seven months, I'd go to his house every month, and we'd read through it and invite friends over and hear it aloud, and then I'd uh, go away and make script revisions and evolve it in a, in a new direction. You know, it was something that began as a, more of a, it was gonna be a children's movie. Um, this was going to be a children's movie? Yeah, it was gonna be like a fairy tale, a modern day fairy tale about, um, you know, I, I looked at his character, Manglehorn, as like a Geppetto and Pinocchio, and it was gonna be about this man trying to put the pieces of love together, and it was gonna, be this uh, uh, children's film, and the more I was talking to Al about it and got his input and insight into it, the more we evolved it just to be more of a coming of age story of this older gentleman. But we wanted to retain those elements of fairy tale and fable. Listen, girl, Coach is a good man. He didn't mean none of that. He's a man of miracles. I remember once we were playing, Coach was like, we wanted to call the game for rain. And he said, keep, keep playing, keep playing, keep playing. Thunder and lightning bolts came down. and There was this little dog off to the side by the dugout. And I remember a little bolt of lightning just hit him, just lit him up. All his fur just went up and the dog coming. Built inside and coach just bent down on his knees and just put his hands out and just patted out the fur. 
fire goes right out and he takes his hand up and there's a flame shooting up from his palm. He just looks me in the eyes and goes, happy birthday. He's like that. He's a special man. There's a lot of attention to the common man, ordinary face, ordinary people. Why is that important for you? For me, it just is a, um, it's something I like in a lot of movies, is to ground them in naturalism. You know, the veterinarian is a real veterinarian, or, or so many of the people in the film are non-actors. Um, and that's important just to, to make it feel like it's of a recognizable world. You know, if we're going to go, if we're going to heighten the reality and go magical with some of the content, I thought what more interesting way, and this is not a Tim Burton movie, let's try to make something that feels like we're eavesdropping in a different universe, of, but it's not too far from our own. And uh, the, the operation we see him doing was a real operation. It's real, yeah. Why did you want it in? Because it's kind of, it's, it's beautiful, but gross as well. Well, it's beautiful. It's also, it's love. It's a different kind of love. You know, you can show love by embracing someone and healing them emotionally, or you can uh, show love the way that this veterinarian, when I, was, when I was talking to vets, I was talking to vets about what we should do within the script to make this feel authentic, and I was talking to him about how it's the true sign of love. He, he gets to take someone's, someone's pet and save their life and, and save them from physical obstruction and basically perform a miracle, and there's a scientific love there that I think it, it is, this is one of the most heartfelt guys I'd ever spoken with, so I integrated him in the process into the movie to show the, the, the brutality, the, um, not even brutal brutality, but the difficult to watch love. It's in the inner cut that with the connection of two people as they're kind of intrigued by each other, falling for each other romantically, inner cut that with uh, uh, the type of love that's harder to watch. All right, Miss Fanny, we're fixing to open you up, young lady. Pop that scalpel blade on my sterile Four by fours right there. Okay, don't touch nothing. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and get that tape. tape. Well, be careful now. Y'all scrubbed her already? She didn't put it on All right, water. put that solution on there. That, that's what needs to be on there right now. Yeah, just drape it on there. Sorry to say, I'm up to withdraw some cash. Because I went for that second opinion. And, um, you know, Fanny got some x-rays. Okay, we're going to open her up here right on the And now they line. put me on a total care plan. What's that? She had to have some involved surgery. And so, uh, you know, I got to pay by the month. There's another moment in this film that's all about love. That's when the guy starts singing, Love Lifted Me or something. Love Lifted Me. And that comes right after that sequence where we've challenged love. We've challenged the awkwardness of two people and we've challenged it by watching this cat uh, be operated on. And then I think the, the resolution is when love kind of magically appears in front of them and expresses itself as two strangers that we're unfamiliar with sing to each other. Yeah, it made me cry. I, damn I'll damn take you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but why? I wasn't quite sure why. Probably why? because it's, it, you take so much time for it to become something. I'm not quite sure why, but it... Why they sing or why what? No, no, why it made me cry. Oh, I don't know either. I, I, it didn't make me cry, but I was very happy with it. I actually... I had uh, I had gone to a church service with a friend of mine to a gospel church, and those those two people sang that song, and so I asked them if they'd do it in the movie. But how did you know it would fit? I didn't, and I thought it might not. And we filmed it, and actually Al said, "This is never going to be in the movie, is it?" And I was like, "Well, you never know." 